So here is my RDP, the same way you will get the RDP for the lab, right? You can see that these are my lab. What I'm going to do on this lab, let me show you in a bigger picture this. I'm going to work on these devices. And this, you can see that these are the black boxes here, only on this portion of the lab. Here I will work where I will configure the OSPF uh, process ID 10, area one. Here I will configure the EIGRP. Here I will configure OSPF area two, and this will be my area C. So even if you have no knowledge about the OSPF anything, I will start from the basic at how the OSPF works and all things about this, right? So let's see that uh, OSPF is basically uh, your uh, link state routing protocol. Link state routing protocol means what? Link state protocol means you are going to share your LSA packet with your neighbors. You're not going to share your routing table. So suppose if I'm going to enable my OSPF between four and 12, OSPF. So the R12 is not going to exchange its routing table to the R4. Same way the R4 is not going to exchange the routing table with R4, R12. No way. So what they are saying? They are saying instead of that the LSA packet, link is said advertisement. That LSA packet contain a lot of information apart from your network, apart from your mask, there will be information that who is the originator of that LSA. How that router is connected to the other router in the topology on which network and how. Right. All information will be there in the LSA. So the only reason of having the wide OSPF is very popular because it is your link state and each and every router have a full visibility about the whole topology. It's not like our distance vector where uh, we have a RIP and EIGRP. What they have, the problem with the RIP and EIGRP, suppose R4 is getting all the routes from the R12, from this side, okay? R4 will never be able to know who is behind this R12. Is there any router R9? Is there any router R19? Doesn't R4 is totally depending on this router R12. But hey, yes, I need to reach on this network. I need to go to the R12. But that is not the case of OSPF. R4 will be able to see who is behind R12, who is behind R9, and how they are connected, all that. So that is the thing which makes it very special and very uh, important. OSPF, the link state routing protocol, that is the reason that in uh, production network you will see 90% of the time we are using OSPF routing protocol. Doesn't matter because it is an open standard, so it will support uh, all the multi vendors in uh, any gears like your Cisco, Huawei, Alcatel, anything. It will support that, right? So that is the first thing. Because of the visibility, because if there is no dependency, it supports for the large network also. If your network is very large, obviously the first choice will be the OSPF routing protocol because we have the concept of a multi-area concept in our OSPF. If uh, if I have, uh, see, in the case of RIP and EIGRP, if I explain you about the RIP and EIGRP, the both are the distance, right? There is no visibility. There is no visibility and they don't uh, know how to reach on that uh, particular router. They're only depending on their neighbor. So that is the problem that RIP and EIGRP is only supported for the small and the medium size, not for the big. Obviously, this is claims that EIGRP you can configure for the large network, but in reality, in production network, it creates a lot of problem if your network is not stable. The big thing for the OSPF, it can support for the large network also, using multi-area concept, right? So that is the first choice will be the OSPF for a large or the big network using multi-area concept. So right now we are going to do that. So this is the first thing, that it what is the difference between the distance vector and the link state. Link state is your OSPF, which provide each and every router the full visibility about the whole network. And each and every router are totally independent. They're not depending on the neighbor. They are going to find out the way how to reach on any particular network. They're not depending on them. Not like your repairing as well, right? That is the problem. Most of the companies using OSPF, and if I say in a percentage, something like 90% 90 of the time you will see that OSPF is working. All right, so how this OSPF work? What is there? Let's see here. Any dynamic routing protocol, your uh, RIP, EIGRP, or OSPF, you need to type this first command, router, OSPF, right? Router, OSPF, add our number, something like this, a process type. 
Process ID can be any number from 1 to 65,535. This process ID need not to be the same on all routers. It's locally significant to your device. Suppose in, in case you are running a more than one OSP process on your single device, then in that case, it will be used. Otherwise, it has no significance between the two, two routes. All right, the first thing is this. This command is going to do what? You need to understand this thing, not to learn that I need to enable the OSP, I need to go for the router OSP. Test. No, that is the, not the case. You need to learn the concept. Router OSP of 10 is going to enable my OSPF on that particular route. But it will be enabled if there is any up interface with IP. If suppose your router is totally new and you are uh, trying to practice about the OSPF and you know the command. So what you do, you will go and you will say that, okay, let's uh, configure the OSPF first and then we'll see the IP configuration. You will type the command router OSPF 10 and instantly you will get the error. OSPF cannot be enabled. Now, if you have no knowledge, no concept, what you will think, okay, this router is faulty. Maybe the iOS is not good. The version is not good. Something is bad with this router. It's not like that. Anytime when you are going to enable your router OSPF 10 command, router will check the first thing. That whether there is any up interface with the IP on your router or not. If there is nothing, then your OSPF will not be activated. It will give you the error. Hey, I'm not able to select a router ID, so I cannot start the OSPF process. So there are two options. Either you can configure the IP or you can manually type your router ID under this command. What is that? Router ID command. And that router ID will be in an IPv4 format, something like this. This way. Then only it will enable. So the first command is doing nothing. It's going to activate your OSPF on that route. It isn't going, it's not going to send any packet, LSA packet onto this router, on this interface, and there nothing will be done. It's just activating and it's uh, getting a one router ID, maybe the manually or automatically, if there is any configuration, right? So this is the first thing. So that, that is the concept about your router OSPF test. Second thing, the network command. Before I go and explain you, I will ask to you guys, there is a network, then I'm going to write my Y card, and then I will write the area. Because OSPF, as I told you, whether it is a small or a big network, you always have to mention the network area ID in your network command. So suppose I'm typing it uh, area one. What this command is going to do, who is going to write in the chat box that what this command will do? Anyone of you, those who want to reply for it, Anyone, those who want to reply, what this network command is going to do? Okay, I think. No, okay, I got, I got, I got. Advertise network in the area, in that area. Advertise the network in that area, traditional way. But I'm not talking about what is that, advertise the network. All of you are going to reply the same. That's totally wrong. Let me say it again. That's a totally wrong. This command is not to advertise this network in OSPF domain. That's totally wrong. So what is that? The problem is this is the, this thing that you are telling me, it is given in the book. Even it is explained by some mentor. But the problem is if you go for the, some reference book or you will go for the RFC, you will see that this network command is not basically advertising and going to advertise my this network. No way. That's a totally wrong concept. So what is that? This network command is basically my router. Once you will type this command, my router will go and search. Hey, is there any interface which is matching with this network or not? Listen it carefully. My router will start, my OSP will start searching. Is there any interface on the router which is matching this network? Okay, if it is matching, your router will start or activate OSPF on that link. Be clear about it. Go and ask to anyone, those who are having experience, uh, those who are even the mentors, they can, you, you can ask. This is the real thing. This is the reason of typing this command. This command will force to OSPF, go and search. 
says any network which is matching with this network and wildcard or not. If it is matching, my route, my OSF will activate the OSF on that. What will happen once it will be activated? Obviously, the first thing my router will start sending. Hello, Patrick. On that link. That is the first thing. Nothing apart from this is going. It's not going to advertise this network right now. No. First of all, it's going to start sending the hello packet on that interface. Suppose you are activating the network command on this interface and on this interface. So on both will start sending the hello packet. Obviously, if it is a packet, IP packet, there will be a two things in that. You know that. What is that? And two thing is that source IP as well as the destination. Correct? So source IP is easy to understand. That if my router 12 suppose sending a hello packet on this link, obviously it will use the 0 to IP as a source IP. Correct? No problem for that. But what my router is going to write is the destination IP because my router don't know what is the IP of R9 here. Correct? So the moment I will enable my network command, my router will start sending hello packet. In the hello packet, there will be what? There will be a two things required source IP and destination. Source IP is easy. Any outgoing interface will be always the source IP if router is generating that packet. But what will be the destination IP? Any guess? Because no way, I'm not going to get the IP of this router 9 interface 0 slash 0. Because we are the human being, we are configuring it. We can know that. But how the router 12 will know? Does he has eyes about to see it? No. Any answer will be welcome. Maybe broadcast. Somehow you are close to that. Is it possible to not use virtual machine? It's slow when you type. Maybe broadcast. Uh, maybe you can observe that, but it will be uh, uh, clear that. Don't worry. Yeah. So the real answer is it will not be the any unicast type. It will be by default a multicast, something like this. Two, 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 four dot zero dot zero dot five. Because I don't know, I mean, R twelve. How the R twelve will know what is the IP of R nine if I want to send a packet? There is no way for the R twelve to know it. So it is going to write that IP as it is. And what is this? This is a multicast. So interesting part about the multicast IP is. When my router 12 is sending to the 9, the router 9 will check this IP. And because he know about that this IP is for the OSPF. Now my router 9 will check, hey, whether I am running my OSPF on this interface 00 or not. If it is running, it will accept the packet. If it is not running, it will discard it. Delete the packet. This is a simple job of your hello packet using the multicast. I'm not using any unicast IP. If I use that unicast IP, how will I get that first question? If I somehow get that um, um, IP of the R9 here on R12 manually, then it's still, it will go to there. So that is why in any routing protocol, whether it is your uh, PIGRP, RIP, or OSPF, the destination IP will be your multicast IP, but not in the case of BGP. When I will check this thing about the BGP tomorrow, you will understand the subject part. So obviously, when I'm going to teach you each and everything, this will be my style. I'm not going to just show you or write down something which is already in the book. The thing which is not in the public domain or which you are not aware about it, I will clear that thing from the zero to the expert level. So is it clear now the, what is that router OSP of 10 command? What is the uh, meaning of this command? And how this hello packet is sent on the multicast IP address? Who and ask to anyone about these three questions? I know that. Out of 10, maybe the 2 or 3 percent will be able to reply if they have the working experience or they have the real understanding about it. All right. Once they will extend the hello packet, obviously, uh, they are not going to exchange any LSA packet with each other. No way. What they will do, they will first make a neighborhood. Routers are going to establish neighborhood with each other. First, they will become neighbors with each other. Once they become the neighbor, then only R9 and R12 are going to exchange the LSA packet with each other. This is the process of OSPF for a single area or between a two router, how we configure it and the meaning of these two commands. And now if you think that I, if I remember these two commands, that's enough for me to go for the sequence. It's useless if you're learning the command. If you don't know the reason behind this command, what is the meaning of this command and what will happen on my router? 
then at the you get to learn these say just the commands okay all right let's see that what different kind of uh, stages my router will go when they are going to become the neighbor so i'm not going to in deep dive this is just a demo class but yeah i will definitely give you uh, some interesting facts about this let me check that yep i will see that see that when the two routers are uh, becoming the neighbor because of the network command exchanging the hello packet these are the ways that they will get first of all they will be in the initial stage or the down stage and the two way means they have exchanged the hello packet once they are exchanged the hello packet they will go in the exit route stage in that exchange they are going to elect a dr and bdr or what they will uh, do election of dr and bdr what is the dr and bdr that all will be clear when you will go for the osp of network time after that they will go in the exchange state in the exchange state what they are exchanging dvd not real lsa packet dvd is just a summary of uh, the all lsa between r1 and r not the real lsa real lsa will be exchanged when your router in a loading state once the let's say are loaded to each other they will go into the full stage full stage if you see on the router it means they have done all these they have gone through the all these stages and they are in a full stage it means they have exchanged the let's say packet all so any time when you are getting uh, any problem the two routers are not able to uh, make a neighborship obviously you will these knowledge will help you double to it if the router are only in the two way stage not going anywhere you need to check that two way will be only if you are matching the same hello timer you are matching with the same area your router id is not same then only the two way will go when it is in a exchange what may be the problem maybe the mtu size is not same mtu is the maximum packet size that means maximum transmission unit the maximum packet size that you can send between r and r if it is not matching your router will be stuck in this state it's hard and it it will never go from that so that will help you to know that your this way i can trouble you what is the problem once it is in a full state nothing is worry to all right let's go back here let's go on the routers and one by one we'll see how it's going to work right i will go to my this this is my lab here i will open my device here and then I think I maybe need to do it again. So we'll go maybe from the nine. How to do that? This is the virtual lab, so you can uh, get that thing. Let me check that right here. Let's get this one here first. And before going to configure anything, let me tell you one more thing: that what is the design plan of the IP? See that if I go back to the page, I'm using this network. Between the two routers, doesn't matter which interface it is, network plan is this. First two part will be one fifty five dot one, and suppose it is between nine and nineteen. So my third outlet will be one ninety nine. Two routers are there, nine and nineteen, and the last part will be according to my router right. Suppose I'm starting on the nine, so it will be nine. This is for the interface, okay? And then for the loopback, each router have a loopback also. What is the loopback IP? Loopback IP is starting with one fifty dot one, and the last two part will be your router number. So if it is nine, it will be nine dot. Yes. And the mask is here for it. For the interface, mask is twenty four. Okay. This way, I'm going to use. It. So no need to confuse any time in this uh, lab. Between the two router nine and nineteen, it will be one ninety nine. Between twelve and nine, it will be one twenty nine. Between four and twelve, it will be one twenty four. Between two and four, it will be twenty four. The third part, third part will be twenty four. Between four and eight, it will be forty eight. Like that, okay? So this is the IP planning. IP is already configured on my all the devices, so I don't have to configure it again. I need to just go and configure these pretty basic stuff, and then show you the thing that I just discussed here, right? Let's go and see that on the nine. Right, I get 
the XSS9 and the name is also changed for the devices. So what I will do now on the 9, I need to show you the IP that I configured here. So you can see that. This is this way, the loop back and this way. What I need to do, I need to configure a sphere between my router 12 and 9 in an area number 1 with OSTF ID 10. So uh, as I told you, that what we are going to do, we are going to write this thing. Route write OSTF. Even if you don't know the command, you can hit the question mark and you can get the option that what I need to type. So I'm uh, going to take the process ID as a 10. As I told you, this process ID is locally significant to your router. It doesn't need to be the same on all the devices. But for any production point of view, uh, from the production network point of view, it is very much required to keep it as a same. So it should look good. All right. Second command will be my network command. So I'm going to enable my OS on this link, not on this link. Only on this link. So what is that? Network 1, 2, and 9. So 129. So I will write this. 155, 1.129.0, and my wildcard. If anyone has any confusion about the uh, wildcard, tell me. I will explain that all. And it will be in area one. That's it. Just one command. But the reality, you need to know about the understanding of this command. What is going to happen? Now my daughter is going to start sending her. And 9 will send, or 12 is not going to receive that. No way. All right, it's done here on 9. Let's go now to the 12 and then see it there. On the 12, we have a two interface, 0, 1, and 0, 2. Let's see that. What is that two interface? So if I go and show you here, you can see that one is 124.12 and one is 129.12, which is 12 and 9, and which is 12 and 4, which is here. Here is my four. Okay. So let's do that. Configure it here also, OSPF. And we'll see the same thing. The concept, what is there? If I can type router OSPF 10. <laughs> router OSPF 10. And my network command, which is two network, 124 and 129.0. So 155.1. Dot one twenty nine dot zero 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 dot two five five dot area one. Why? Because twelve and nine are connected to this link, and this link is my in area one. Okay, one more thing. Area is an interface concept. It's not a router concept. So my router twelve may be in a two, uh, maybe in a two area. Like um, one interface zero two is in area one, and one interface zero one is in area zero. So be careful. Area is an interface concept. It is not a router concept. Never. Never mess up with that. Second network is my 124. So I will change it to the 124. Something like this. Right? It's done here. And you can see that my neighbor is also standing. All right. Before I go and uh, to tell you something else, tell me one more thing about it. I just configured my OSPF here on both this. Neighbor is established. If I go and show you IPO statement, they are the neighbor and the neighbor is the port. Right? Neighbor is up between R9 and 12. So obviously, the R12 is going to get the root of 9 loop back as a OSPF. If it is enabled. So obviously, what I did here on 9. I just enable on my this interface here on this interface, not on my loop. So what, what happened? Obviously, whatever you are enabling on that interface, that network can be shared, not anything else. I'm not sharing this network. So obviously, this is not in my R12. R12 is getting nothing. So what I need to do, I need to enable it on my loop back. It's 150.1. Uh, maybe the 0.0, .0 I can type. 0 .0 .0 0.0255255. And I can decide about the area, whatever I want. Right, let's check that. That my IP is already there. Yes, 151. If I go here on 12, I will be able to see the loop back as our sphere of two. As you can see here, this is O means it is the same area. Intra area root O means. In the bracket, we have a two things. The first thing about your AD value, the admin distance. The second thing is your matrix, the cost. In case of OSPF, 
This metric is called as a cost. How to calculate that? It's a very easy formula is reference bandwidth. By default, your reference bandwidth is 100 Mbps. Only 100 Mbps. And divide it with your real bandwidth of the interface. And you will get your cost of any interface. Perfect. Okay. Now, this is from the point of uh, CCNP. That how to create, what is the meaning of this command, what is the meaning of this command, what will happen, how many stages will be there in my neighbor seat and all that. This is from the point of your CCNP. Now, same thing will apply for your CCNP. What they will ask, they will ask something like this. Let me show you the running config of OSP of what we did. They will ask, enable your OSP of 9 on this interface and on the loop back, but there will be a condition. You cannot type uh, two network command. You have to do it in a one. This is the way how the CCI, obviously in CCI exam also, they will ask how to configure OSPF uh, in the different tasks. They will ask how to configure the DGP, but there will be what condition will be there. They will not ask simply to configure the voice of here. They will ask configure the OSPF on nine, but and enable it on both the interface loopback as well as on zero slash zero, but it has to be by one network command. Any guess how we can do that? Let me check, is there any reply? Is there any reply for this? No. Please guess if you can, that what will be the way, how we can enable this OSPF by the one network command. Obviously, the first thing is clear that this network command is to activate my OSPF on the interface, not to end that. So how can I enable by the one network command on my both 00, zero as well as on my loopback? So this is the one question that is asked in your CCI exam this way, not the same. So I can do that. What I can do, I can type my network command in like this, four times 000, zero, zero. And for the wild card, I can write four times 555. And then my area number, which is one, this way. And that's it. What is this? Zero, zero, zero means any network. Four times two, five, five wildcard means any mark. So I'm telling my router that, hey, enable my OSPF on all the interface. This is the one way to do it. But what is the problem here? If you are good enough to know the meaning of this network command, you can easily go for this command. But there is one more condition in the future. What was the condition? You can use only one command. And it should not be enabled on your this interface. Then you will be in a trouble because if this zero zero is going to enable it on your all interface. Here also, here also, here also, and the loop back out. So that way you cannot do it. You have to find out that my this 150 and 155 will be covered in which wildcard mark. So if your knowledge about the mark and wildcard is good, then only you can solve this problem. of That is why the CCI is tough, because of the condition. Because not because they are going to ask something else. No, they are asking the same thing that you are going to learn in the system, but there will be concept, there will be condition. So that make it tough, that make it difficult to type the command, right? So understanding the things from the basic to the expert level can solve this problem. Second thing, they may ask that, hey, you are not allowed to type network command, enable your OSP without touching the network. Then you need to know the more about OSP. How can I do that without typing the network command and enable my OSP? There is a way I can go under each interface and I can e enable my OSP. If, I, if you want to uh, see it, let me tell you that how we can do it. T0 slash zero. And I can type my POS here, my process ID, my area, and my AI. I don't need to type my different network command. So it depends what is asked in the CCI question with the condition. Enable OSPF with one network command. Enable OSPF without network command. So you need to know about all this. Right? This is the way how it works. I did it here on my 9 and 12. They are working now. I will go on my router 4. And then see, router four is having a three interface. Router four having a three interface. This one 
which is going here toward R2 and one which is going toward the 8 and one toward going 12. This is the only thing we are using. We are not using this part. Okay. So here on R4, I need to worry about this, that this part is in my area 0. This part is in my area 0. This part will be in my area. So we need to think about that. If they're all is in the same area, I need to be very clear about it. So let's go on R4. And on R4, I'm going to apply the same logic of a zero command. I'm not going to use the, all the three different network commands here. I will go under my router, or say a pen, and then I will type here my network command 0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 4 times 255, 255, 255. And my area will be zero. So what this command is going to do? This command is going to enable my OSPF on all the interface of my network, including my loop backup. Right? That's it. It will establish the neighbor with 12 that you can see here. Neighbor tape is up. Loading is done. Once the loading is done, you will get this log. Done. All right? This is the way how we can do OSPF. Now, if I go and check my IP OSPF root, IP root, Yep. So if I will be see my two loop back, one from the nine, one from the twelve. One loop back is your this, and one loop back is this. And both the loop are how they are presented here. OIA. What is the meaning of this OIA? Even if you don't remember it, always there is a code given. You can check it there. OIA is given here. OSP of enter area means. This is the root which is coming from another area. It is not my area zero root. It is coming from this area one. That is the meaning of OIA. Right? It's done here. Let's go for the next router, which is eight. Anybody here? On eight, what we need to worry about? On eight, we have a two interface. One interface is going on my this router, which is four, which is in area zero and which is four and eight so means it is 48. let's see that so ip interface brief yes one is 148 one is 8 and 13 definitely with the switch so they will be in that zero one so let's enable it quickly and then see that router osp of 10 and then my network here i cannot use that net network command zero 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 because it will be only for the one area so what I will do, I will use network command properly, 155, 1.48.0, 0.0.0.255, and area will be what? Zero, correct? Same area. And then my second network command, which is 155.1. It is between 4, 8, and 13, so it will be 138. 138.0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.255 and this area will be three. I have a loop back also. I will keep my loop back also in area three. 150, 1 dot, 8 dot 8, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then area will be three. All right? Yes. The last router is left here. Then we'll see a very interesting concept about this OSPF, the inter area route, the LSA type, and all things we are going to do. So let me quickly configure it here on my R3. All my interface of the R13 is on area 3. So our area 2 is, is written here, but it, I'm configuring it on area 3. So let's quickly configure it in area 3. All the interface. So I will use the network command 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, .0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 4 times 255. And then my area. So it will become the neighbor with 13. And it's going to get all that information. Interesting part is what here is this. Anytime when you are working with a multi-area concept, how many LSA you can see on your network? Anytime when I'm working with a multi-area, like here, I have a one area here. This one. I have a one area here, which is area zero. And then I have a one more area which is here. Like three areas. So if you are having a one area in your whole topology, in that case, you will only see the two type of LSA. LSA one and LSA two. But if you are working with a multi-area concept, you will see the three type of LSA. LSA one, two, and three. What is that LSA three? LSA three is your 
inter area means it is going from one area to another area who will generate that lhs field there is also called as a summary lhs why it is called as a summary lhs anyone can give uh, write down in the chat box what summary lhs is doing and this lhs will be generated by the area border route the router which is connecting two or more area that is called as the area so here my router 12 is the area same way my 8 is the area so these routers are going to generate that lsa free inter area or lsa free summary lsa call why we call it as summary that i am looking for the, some reply then i will tell you let me show you now these uh, database of OSPF and all the route on my router this. See that? I'm getting all my route like the loopbacks of all the routers, four, eight, nine, and also the interface between the routers. If I go and show you the LSP type on my router, which will be in my database table of OSPF, as you can see here, I'm getting three type of LSP. With that, LSP one is my router LSP. LSA2 is my netlink LSA, LSA3 is my summary LSA. These are the three types of LSA. If you want to see the detail of these uh, LSA, you can go and type this command. Uh, one particular LSA you want to see, then you need to type that. This way. Type that over. And you can see that inside what we have in the LSA. Obviously, there will be the ID, who is the advertising route for that. There will be the information about the mask, about the network, or, and the matrix. All things will be there inside your LSA packet. Always there will be one thing, who is the originator of that LSA. It is very, very important. That provides only the visibility to the all route. Right? This is the way how you can check for all database table and different type of LSA. In detail, in depth, will hundred percent go according to the course of CCN and CCNP. Each and everything about the checksum things, about these LSAs, what the role of this, what is the significance, that all will go. The lifetime of any LSA is for the maximum is one hour. But it doesn't mean that your router will resend that LSA after the one hour. No, it will send it from anything from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. In between, it is going to reflect the LSA. All right, anyone, any reply is there for the summary, let's say, why we call it as a summary, let's say, I think I go, uh, okay. I got a reply as a not pure. It's okay if you don't know, doesn't matter. But this is my promise that you will learn something which is not in the books or in online videos here. So summary, let's say, what do you think? That summary, let's say, means uh, my router, the ABR, is going to summarize my the loopback of 9 and 12 and this interface and then only going to send it to these router to the area zero or oh my this ABR will do the same thing is it going to summarize so never confuse with the word summary ls summary ls doesn't mean that your ABR router is going to summarize your internal network and only set the one link. let's prove it go on any router like on a router 13 and check that whether I'm getting a summary route or I'm getting the detailed route of 9 8 and all See that I'm getting the detailed route of each interface four, eight, nine. All right, can you see that? I'm not getting any summary thing. So, why we call it, it, it a summary route that is very important here to understand why we call it a summary route. And who is generating that? My ABR router, a router which is connected to the two different areas that is called as ABR. So, the reason of calling it as a summary. See, anything which is between my uh, one area, it will be always as a form of LSA1, LSA2. When it is reaching to the ABR, ABR is going to convert that into the LSA3. And then LSA3 will go here toward the area Z. That's it. it is going to convert into the LSA3. So it's not summarizing. What it is doing, it is telling to this route, hey, if you want to reach on this LSA3 network, you need to restrict your metric calculation till here. Means R4, if you want to reach, suppose on the loopback of 9, it's going to calculate its metric till here, till the ABR. It's not going to calculate the metric from 4 till 9. No, 
that is restricted because of electricity. That is why we call it summary. It's summarizing the path, restricting the path that from where to where you can calculate that. So once this electricity will reach on R4, R4, because you know that in OSPF, each router is going to calculate its own path, how to reach on this network, how to reach on that. But here, in the case of electricity, inter area, your router will be restricted to here, ABR. You can only calculate the path here. And whatever the ABR is giving you the path for this electricity, suppose it is giving you the path of 40 something. What is that? 40. So you will believe that I can reach on 40. And in that 40, you will add your this local cost. That's it. You will not go from here to here, then from here to here and calculate your uh, SPF path algorithm. No way. That is why we call it as a summary list. Not because this LSF is summarizing any root of my run. No way. Okay. The problem is the books also giving these same kind of information summary. Let's say it is giving the summary route to the router. No, it's not giving any summary route. Be careful about it. It's not giving any summary route to any device. Nothing. It's only going to restrict the router. Area border router is going to restrict. Hey, you can allow till here, till me to calculate the SP path. Not apart from that. Not after that. Okay. After that, you are not allowed to do that. So that is the reason of a summary. So here, let's say one and two will be only inside the area. They will be sharing the information about the network and all, all these things. Let's say three is also sharing the same network information, but between the two areas. Let's say one and two will never cross the boundary of any area. No way. In any circumstances, they are not going to cross the boundary of area. This will be the same inside that area. That is the problem because let's say one and two have the full reachability. Uh, Means like, suppose there are ten routers, so you cannot have any root filtering inside the area in case of OSPF. It's not possible. Root filtering or summarization is only possible at the border of two areas, not inside a one. Okay, be careful. Now, where is that? There is two LSAs, like LSA four and five. Let's say four and five. For what reason we use that LSA four and five? So in the normal scenario, in a multi-area concept, I need just only three LSA. Let's say one, two, and three. Not the LSA four and five. LSA four and five will be required if you are injecting any root in your OSPF domain from any other routing protocol. So here is my OSPF domain from here till here, all of them. And here, what I'm doing, here I'm running, suppose, EIGRP. So if I want to inject my EIGRP root in OSPF domain, then that will be done by my DSLSA 4 and 5. It will be given to the all routers, to the all area, by your LSA 4 and 5. In normal scenario, there will be no such thing. Only in the case I want to inject my other routing protocol into the OSPF domain, means I want to do the redistribution. In that case, you will be able to see the LSA 4 and 5. And in LSA 4 and 5, the router which is generating router 9 in this case here, that router is called as an ASDR, Autonomous System Boundary Router. ASDR, Autonomous System Boundary Router. That router is doing the redistribution, injecting the route from the EIGRP to the OSP. You can inject from the OSP to the EIGRP. It's up to you. So that router is going to generate the LSA 4 and 5. And this router, once this LSAs are generated once, it will be the same. Nothing will be changed by this router ABR or this router ABR, nothing. It will go to the all areas. Same way, nothing will be changed. There. Okay, let's see the quickly how to see the LSA 4 and 5 in this topology. What I'm going to do quickly, I'm going to take the access of 19 also, which is here, and I will configure the EIGRP on that route. Let's do that. Router EIGRP. Here, the number which you are typing, this is not called the process ID. This is called autonomous system. And this number should match with all the routers. If it is not matching, they will never become the network. Uh, then I will type my network. What I will type my network, I have a two network. Uh, let's see that. What is that network? To show IP the phase three, these are my two networks 199 between 9 and 29. And this is my link. So let's enable it quickly on my board interface. This is 155.1.0.0.0.255. .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0 .0. See that? 
I am writing this network. It doesn't mean that I am going to advertise this network to my neighbors. No, it means I want to enable my EIGRC on any interface which is matching first to update this. Zero means in the wildcard exact match. Two five five means I don't care. That's it. Same way I will enable it on my loop back which is one fifty five dot one zero dot zero, and then I loop back two five five, two five five. Set is done on 19, then go to the 9. Router 9 is here. I need to enable it only on my one interface, which is going towards this router, which is 199. But the interesting part my eight numbers, autonomous system numbers, have to be the same. This is it. Let's do that. It will be 155, 1.199, 1 only 199. 199.000.025. I cannot use that only with two octaves. If I do that, it will really enable on my this interface and look back also that I don't have. That I will just enable it on my one interface. Very fast. Then instantly you will get the neighborhood is established between 9 and 19. The reason is the EIGRP is the fastest starting protocol because it has the hello and dead interval very small. It is five seconds only, and 15 seconds is the dead time. That's why it is very fast, five and 15 seconds. If I want to see the neighbor seat, I will be able to see it here with this command, show IP as you have neighbor. Even these command is not required to remember, practice it. The more you practice, the more you will learn. So I am the neighbor with my, with my router 19, on interface 02, my hold on timer, which is a countdown timer, it will uh, um, set at 15 seconds, and then at the time you get the update, you will reset it again, and you will count down. Uptime is the real thing. Anytime when you are troubleshooting for your EIGRT, always check the uptime. Is it for the 30 minutes, 30 seconds, what that? Then you will get whether it is flagged or not. Then we have a three interesting things here, SRTT, RTO, Q count, and second number. These are the pretty interesting things. These are going to make my EIGRP a reliable protocol. And see that, is it required to make any routing protocol reliable? It's just between the two devices, right? It's just between my these two devices, which is my 9 and 19. What kind of reliability I want? But yeah, this is the way how they have designed. So they we need these things, SRGT, smooth round, uh, round trip timer, RTO, retransmit timeout, Q count. That thing is for the reliable. Q count is the very important when you are troubleshooting. Q count has to be the zero. If it is one, see the two number you will get in production network all the time, either zero or one. If it is one, there is a problem. Your EIGRP is not working properly. Might be the looping problem, might be the, the CPU issue with your router, some other reason. But yeah, if the Q count is one, it means there is a problem. It's not working properly at all. All right, let's check the quickly route on my nine. Uh, EIGRP root, I will get only one, which is my 19 do back IP address. That's it. Okay, now tell me if my router 9 is working with both OSPF as well as EIGRP, whether this is uh, 9 is going to set it with the OSPF domain or not. What do you think? Whether my OSPF, this router 9 is going to set it with the OSPF or not. Or this thing now. 9 having the both EIGRP as well as OSPF, but by default, router will never mix up anything from one routing protocol to another routing protocol. No way. It can be done only by redistribution. You have to inject that to it forcefully, not by the default to you that was kept So right now, if I go on my, any router like maybe on the 13, 13 is not going to get my 19 through back, no way. It's not going to get that 19 to back. No way. No chance. Because router will never mix up the two routing protocol. You have to forcefully inject it. So let's go on 9 and inject my the OS, the EIGRP route into the OSP flow. So let's go to the 9 and do the 9. How to do that? I need to go under my OSPF process. Like this way, router OSPF 10. Redistribute my EIGRP, the process number 10 and write the word submit, it means I want to send my all the network of 19 as it is without any submit. That's it. 
is that now if I go and I will see on 13, I will be able to see the loop back of 19 on my display. Within a second, once that is enabled, yeah, you can see that. I'm getting that 19 root on my 13 route, which is here as a E2, E means external root. It is a OE2 type means external root is that. Here is the information about more external time. So I'm getting this root because of LSFI. I'm getting this root because of LSFI. When anything is redistributed from any other routing protocol to the OSPF, that LSFI will transport that network to the OSPF domain to the all area. Okay. If it is the case, then for what purpose we have the LSF4? Right? What is the reason of having the LSF4? As I told you, you will get the LSF4 and 5 only in the case of summarizes or redistribution. Only LSF5 is sending the network information from the EIGRP domain to the OSPF. And for what purpose we have the LSF4? Let me tell you. LSF5 is about the network information that you are getting from there. And LSF4 is for information about who is doing the redistribution. Which route? Router 9. So the router 9 information that it is an ASBR router, this information will go to the all devices via LSF4. See that? This is my LSF4. This LSF4 is only containing the information about who is my ASBR, which is doing the redistribution. And this is LSF4. And this is my LSF5. LSF5 is containing what? LSF5 is containing my information network information from the other routing protocol. Okay, quick question. Can anyone tell me that 13 is getting that root of 19? Can it ping to that or not? 151.1919. Can I ping that or not? Any quick reply you can give if you want. It doesn't matter if you don't want to reply. No, that's great reply. It's very much um, great reply. It's a requirement. Uh, it's very much required from a guy who is, if you can say that, yeah, it's not going to be. The reason is why, obviously, uh, R13 having a way to reach on the 19, that's okay. But the problem is 19 has no information about the 13. So that is the reason. See that? 19 has no information. In the routing table, if I go and check that, 19 has nothing in touch. The reason? I did only the one-way injection from EIGRP to the OSPF, not from the OSPF to the EIGRP. That is why 19 is not getting anything in the route. No routing information. So obviously it will drop the path. So if I go and see it here, 13 is able to read there. So if I trace through this, 150.1.1919 and write the word numeric to complete in a second. See there, I'm able to read 129.9, which is 129.9 here, and then we'll finally go to there. But the thing is, it's not going on beyond that. The reason, 19 has a no root. So what I need to do, I need to inject the OSP of root from OSP of domain to the EIGRP. Then only 19 will get that. Right now, nothing is there. So let's go back to the 9, that of 9 is here, and we'll see that. I want to inject my OSP of root into the EIGRP. So first I will go under my EIGRP, right? This way, router EIGRP 10 and redistribute my OSPF, inject my OSPF root in the EIGRP domain, which is 10. But because this is my distance vector routing protocol, so I have to provide a seed matrix. If I don't provide that, what happens? My root, redistributed root will be unreached. My EIGRP will think that it has a Unreachable matrix by default. So by default, you have to set the matrix. Otherwise, these redistributed root in EIGRP will be unreachable. Anything you can set, something like this. Why I'm doing that? Because matrix calculation in case of EIGRP is very complicated. It's going to use five parameters. What is that? Your bandwidth, delay, load, reliability, MCU. These are the five parameters which is included in your uh, matrix calculation of EIGRP. So you need to write that five times. It's done now. Obviously, now my 19 is going to get that with the fruit. So get that. Within a second, it's going to get that. See that? It's getting that with the fruit as a DEX, means external from any other routing protocol to my EIGS. Interesting thing 
in if you are a working professional and you are doing this kind of a thing one thing you need to take up the person when you are doing the registration when you are doing a redistribution on a one device something like here what i did here here i just did my redistribution on one router on a single device so when you are doing your redistribution on a single device no need to be scared about it. no problem at all all the time you will listen that engineers are telling that hey we can create a looping problem nothing can happen my promise if you are doing a redistribution only on a single point there is no problem of looping at all yeah if you are doing your redistribution on more than two routers or the two points then you need to worry about it right it's very very interesting thing. and we are obviously going to do this kind of thing if i check now to reach on any ips like if i want to reach on 13 which is here i will be able to reach on that ah. ping it and then see i'm in the ping can't see for that i end to end reachability is there from 19 to the 13 there is no issue with that so interesting part what do you get from here the interesting part is to understand the logic behind each and every command if your logic and concept is clear about any command that's no need to remember command. logic is clear the concept is clear you can work with a big to big topology doesn't matter how big the topology how big is the network stick to your basic to your fundamentals right so this is the only thing that i wanted to clear about your uh, a demo class for the ospf last i will go for the next thing not in the lab in the slide about that what you are going to learn in the automation part why this is very very popular all over the world why the cci enterprise is very demanding in the market right now because of this software defined network the software defined network is not something any device or i'm talking about any uh, particular vendor like this software defined networking means earlier all the things my routers my switches were doing they have the three planes control plane management plane and the data plane as you can see here so it uh, it was the traditional way to doing the um, uh, network but what software defined networking suggests to shift it the control plane we are going to shift from the devices to a central device which is called the as the agent control it depends on the vendor which vendor you are working if it is cisco the device is called as a dns center for the access layer kind of component see that i have a three plane earlier in the traditional way but now with the help of sda technology software defined uh, networking we have removed that control function in shift it to my dn a one controller basically to a one controller which is going to manage each and everything which is going to manage each and everything it's going to do the routing task it's going to do the erp things it's going to maintain that uh, uh, routing table and all that what basically is doing the reason of shifting this things to my dn center this device is a cisco device so don't think that you will get it uh, in all other vendors device this is only for a cisco cisco dna center so basically here when i'm shifting my control plane to the dna center basically what i'm doing what i'm doing here i'm basically shifting these things and i'm going to do the intent based control intent based means it's based on me how the traffic should go from here to there this traffic should go from this network or that network that all is done by the one device controller it's going to configure all these routers it's going to control the traffic how it should go for uh, video traffic for the audio traffic and all that that is called intent based control function by the dns that all it will be done by the dns we have the lab you will see all these things in the lab also how to configure the devices the zero touch deployment you just connect the devices and the rest thing will be done from the one device ui access obviously this will be the ui access if you want to see the portal of page how the portal looks like i believe i have i have something like for the dna center like this page ui this. you can control all the switches and routers you can configure any uh, protocol you can configure the ip address all things you can do by this sdn controller or the sda based interesting thing here in your sda defined there are two things two interface are there 
according to our direction, north and south and east and west. What is that? Northbound interface and the southbound interface. Any communication between the controller toward the my devices, router and switches, that interface is called your southbound interface. And uh, controller to my UI base or the human interaction with that controller, that interface is called as a not monitor. Ne never confuse. Just check this direction. And you will always be clear about this, that which is the southbound and which is the northbound. Obviously, which is going toward the up direction, it's the northbound. Which is going down, it's the southbound. It's very easy to remember about it. That is, then interfaces are what? Southbound and northbound. Southbound interface is going to interact with your real devices to configure, to force any path to force any uh, priority for shifting the traffic to here and there. How it will talk, it will talk based on open flow in your that way. Then we have the not born interface. In the not born interface, you are, the human being is interacting with the controller. How? By the not born interface. The popular protocols that you will use will be the REST API, JSON. These are the, basically the formats. How to represent the machine thing to my, to, to, to the human being in a readable form. Like saying that uh, REST APIs are what? HTTP, that we, uh, if we want to access any web server, how we are doing that? Using the HTTP protocol, HTTP or the HTTP. Same way, if the, the human being is going to interact and want to do something with the agent controller, it will use that REST API condition. There are other structural languages, modeling languages that you will learn and you will understand the basic thing, but the lab is there for the, yep, 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 don't worry about it. That is the USP of this course. If you are going to learn these emerging things, that is why I'm telling you this is the most demanding course in the market. SDN, how this works, the SDA, the uh, DNA center, the uh, SD band things, that all is there. If I show you the lab I have here, uh, let me go to my desk. See that, this is the, go down, let's go down and see. This is my, uh, SD WAN lab, which is set up there in uh, available in there. You can practice and you can work on that, right? So this is the way how we are designing all the labs. You will get it the access from the RDP. You can work on that. Obviously, once you will understand the concept after the class, not at the starting, right? So these are the things that you will be given here in this, and you will understand about that. In SDN, defined networking, and and one very interesting thing. The SD WAN is very popular in the market. Anyone means any time when you are going for the interview, uh, out of ten, you will get nine times to be asked by the SD WAN. The interesting thing is this to understand that what is SD WAN. I don't know whether you know about it, whether you have watched any video about it or not. Let me clear in a very simple way, in a very simple way to understand. What was the concept? When uh, there was a traditional way, when there are there are three to four branches of a company and they want to connect to each other, how they will connect? Obviously, they will take uh, some MPLS link from the ISP, Metro Ethan link, link from the ISP, like that. And they're connecting with them. The problem with that kind of a connection with the ISP, MPLS or the Metro Ethan link, it is very costly. It's not like our normal internet. It's a private network. It's a secure. It's providing you the dedicated speed all the time. Suppose you have taken the MPLS link of 100 Mbps. That 100 Mbps will be all the time 24 by 7. Not our like normal broadband connection. What you listen the word, if you see the proper plan, you get the word up to. Up to means maximum you can get the 100, not the 100. So that's basically the sales term that will be used always the marketing term. But MPLS is something which is providing the constant guaranteed bandwidth to connecting to the branches to the headquarters. That was the, right now this setup is working properly from the last 20 years. For any branch, for any bank, suppose there is a one head office in the branch, which having the money data center, they have in the head office, all the branches will connect with that. How? By the MPLS network from the ISP or the Metro Ethernet from the ISP. It was very costly. But the problem, why we are shifting toward this divan? Right? This is very important. The reason is now any bank or any other company, they're not having their data center on their headquarter. What they're doing, they are shifting their data center to the cloud on the internet, like on Google, AWS, Azure, 
uh, drug box there. Why? Because they don't want to maintain all these things. They don't want to any expertise from any um, a person who is working at the bank. Because bank business is to do the transaction, to deal with the finance, not with the server and maintain that. So that is why any core company which is dealing with the finance is not going to manage these kind of things. They are stepping it toward the cloud, toward the uh, cloud-based services like on AWS, Azure, Dropbox, Microsoft Office, and all that. What they are doing, they are giving that to them. And they are obviously the cloud is going to us. The problem is now, if again, if still we are going to connect my branches to the head office, branches to the head office, and they are going toward the internet from the head office to the cloud to access that uh, server to the data. What will be the problem? Now your data center will be congested. The link which is going toward the internet will be congested all the time because suppose you have 100 branches. 100 branches traffic will come to the headquarters and that will go toward the internet. That is the problem. So, and you need to increase the now bandwidth from here, from here, from here all the time. So the better solution is why when my server is connected to the cloud, why should I go through my data center HQ? The reason was security. So how can I directly go from my branches to the cloud and access my data center with security? So that's combined. SD-WAN device. What is SD-WAN doing? SD-WAN is providing two things. Normal one link from the SD-WAN will still go to the headquarters because all the server your uh, bank is not going to sit on the cloud. Cloud still it will secure some more very secure or the very high uh, capable router. They will still keep it there, but all the rest they will set set it to the cloud. So on SD-WAN, when I will use on my these branches and on my headquarters, what SD-WAN will do? SD-WAN still will have a one link toward the headquarters, but that will be now very less bandwidth. Earlier, suppose it was 100 Mbps. Now it will be only for the 10 Mbps. So the 10 time, the cost will be reduced. And the link which is going toward the internet will be added from the SD-WAN. Now, when SD-WAN wants to connect to the server on the cloud, it is going to make a secure connection by the IP sector now. Nothing will go as an open packet. So anytime an SD-WAN is going to send that to connect to the cloud on the server, it will be on a secure connection, encrypted traffic by the IP sector all the time. Even here, you can make it as an IP sector. Earlier, it was open, but because it was a private network, there was no risk. But still, you can make it as a secure by the IP sector on the MPLS. So don't confuse that SD-WAN, it means I'm going to replace my existing MPLS. No, it's still it is required. Still headquarters having some routers or the some servers at their end. Once they are going to shift everything on the cloud, it's still, in that case, I don't need. It may be shifted toward them. Right? So don't think that SD1 is going to replace your MPLS. No, nothing is going to happen. It's still, I need to connect my branches with the head office for uh, other communication. It's not like all the time to the data center. Maybe there's a normal communication here and all that. So the SD WAN is on the branches will provide two things. One is toward the internet, which will enable to access the cloud, one is toward the head office to access the private network through the MPLS. That is the way, way we are using it. So what we get from here that SD WAN is going to reduce the cost of network at least 10 times. Because earlier if I was using 100 MBPS link for uh, Connecting to the head office, I will use only the 10 MBPS. And at the same time, I will get security enhanced in the case of SD WAN. Third thing, because all my these SD WAN devices will be controlled from a, from a one controller. They, it has a three part. It has a three part that is called as a D managed, D born, and D smart. These are the three parts of your SD WAN controller. That's going to control your all the devices. That's going to control these three things are going to control your other device. And zero touch uh, deployment is also zero, zero touch deployment means you can just connect and just configure one IP on that SDN device. And now the rest you can do it from the controller. Earlier, suppose if you are connecting a branch router, configuring BGP, configuring MPLS, configuring OSPF, it takes a lot of time for a network engineer to physically visit that. But now with the help of controller, SD WAN controller, I can do it in a second within a minute. So SD-WAN is also saving the time. The task that I was doing a full day that I can do with the help of automated template-based tool in a few minutes. Saving the time, saving the money, 
third thing. Earlier, I suppose there is any problem on my branch ground. We have a legacy way of maintaining that by the SNMP protocol, by uh, remote logging, by the telnet and SSS, and checking that what is the problem there. I don't need now. In the case of software-defined network, I can manage my all the z devices from the controller. I can see there is a proper and a bit of visibility what kind of a traffic is passing from my network. And not only the traffic, I can differentiate that which kind of a traffic is going on from my sd -band. Video, voice, data, and content also. Which kind of application is used from this branch? Which kind of application they are using? They are using more or less to connecting with the web server, connecting with the meetings, connecting with the multicast traffic, that all you can have a full visibility on your SDN control. Proper visibility about the traffic, the type of data, the content, all things you can manage from it. You can plan it. You can plan now which traffic should go through the internet, which traffic should go through the MPLS, how much traffic I have on this link, how much traffic I have in this link, intent-based control function I can do from here. Planning, proper planning because of the full visibility. Any problem I have on my sd WAN, I will obviously observe it in the UI option of the sd WAN control. Everything will be there. So proper saving of the time, cost saving, full visibility, proper uh, the better management because of the proper visibility, proper management of the traffic, getting all the 24 by 7 support of these things, where you can manage each and everything. Obviously, open engineer is still required. Who is going to watch these things all the time? Not a one. Obviously, the three engineer in the eight hours. So that is the things that we are getting in the SD WAN. So it's a very important if, if you go and watch now the two hour video about the SD WAN and, and, and just come back again to this uh, 10 minute uh, intro of SD WAN and compare it whether you get the knowledge from here or from that two hours. So the thing. Any mentor's job is to make the thing simple, not to make it as a complicated. What some mentor thinks that if I make the things complicated, they will think I'm very smart. It's not like that. Any mentor's job or the instructor's job is to make things simple, as simple as possible, so that a student can connect with it and understand that what I'm trying to explain you guys. All right. So this is about your SD WAN, and you have we have the proper lab that you will get it here. All the things will be discussed in that. And if I show you some more thing about my SDN controller, the DNS, what it is going to do. It's going to control my router switches. But see, the DNA is basically for my LAN, right? for my access network. SD WAN is the solution for my WAN connectivity between the branches, between the head office, like that, the WAN connectivity. SDN or the DNS center is for my local access network to manage this problem. How? Let's see a one example. How my DNS center will manage. See that. If suppose I don't have any uh, software defined networking, legacy network, right? These I have a routers, I have a switches, there is a one HTTP server. I want to provide this PC one which is having this IP 203.0.113.105 to access the server. How will I provide in an old technology? Way? Obviously, I will make an access list here on R2, and I will say that, hey, if you want to go to access the server, allow me. Right? This way, this PC will be allowed. But the problem with this uh, old or the traditional way of uh, networking, suppose if this is a laptop, and this person is shifting from this switch to this switch here, to this one. Will he be able to access the server now? Obviously, no, because this access list is here on R2. And when he's shifting, uh, shifting his position from S3 to the S1, which one? It's not going to get that. So that is the challenges we have in our traditional way of networking. There is no mobility. There is no visibility. A lot of time involved to do the troubleshooting. A lot of time involved to provision a new device. So it is just a simple example. But if suppose this is the same thing and the uh, suppose the same requirement in the SDN, how we'll do that? We'll do it this way. I will have the server, I will have the ICE uh, device, and I will connect with the SDX or the DNS entry. What I will do now, I will not use uh, the IP of my PC1 to provide the access of server by the access. What I will do, I will make security group. 
Click to group, I will bind its name, username and password with the ID. But hey, if the username and password is this, allow this guy to have that password. And this ID is in the back end going to talk with the DNS in to get that SGT, to get this security tag. Security tags will be forced to the ICE and I will force that access list to my disk switch, not to the router. Be careful. ICE is going to force my this security group or the access list to my disk switch, not to my router now. So now PC1 dynamically, this k is going to get the access of for the server automatically dynamically. Even if it is shifting here on S3, it's going to give his username and password. Still, again, it is going to my DNS. DNS center will see that, hey, the SGSD applies for this to get the access of server. I will force that access list to this switch and you will get the access of that. So that kind of a flexibility will get in the software defined network, right? So SDA for your local network to have the proper management of your access network. SD WAN for the brand, for the brand concept. Right, it's a big thing which will be there. Can DNS center work without the eyes? See, the DNS center will force the policy to the eyes. And I'll, our uh, eyes is going to enforce that policy to my switch. Access list will be forced from the eyes, not from the DNS center. DNS center is controlling my devices for what routing protocol will be there, how the traffic will go there, how this traffic will go from here to there. Obviously, that uh, DNA will give that information to the eyes. Not directly, the DNA will force it. Send that security group to the switch one directly. It will be through the eye. If it is not Cisco, it will be other device like the Aruba from the HP. From the HP, there is a very popular device, Aruba. Same thing, which is the, we are doing here in that. So security enforcement will be done from the eyes, from the DNA to the eye, and then from the eyes to the switch is where we are going to start. All right. All detail. The thing is, you can see that. See, from the last 20 years, nothing changed in this networking, the traditional way. We are still working with that way. But from the last three years, we are shifting towards it. As we access, we are shifting towards the DNA thing. If you are not going to upgrade yourself, obviously, you will be out from the market within a two to three years. There is no scope for any one who is a brilliant in the SD or in the BGP, MPLS, VPN, and all that thing. You need to upgrade yourself to these automations. If you don't upgrade, obviously you will be not in market. Maybe not now, maybe two after two years, maybe after three years, four years, but obviously you will be. And so these are the things that you will get it here. SD WAN, DNS Center, which is very popular, how it works, what kind of a programming is there, a bit information, the basic things will uh, that's not the practical for the uh, programming part, but the basic will obviously talk about it. All that in the detail which is required to clear any interview. To clear your CCN in core exam or your CCI lab. CCI lab, you can only clear if your understanding about any topic is clear from this way, from that basic thing, from the fundamental way. To understand the concept behind each command, how the packet, OSPF packet are flowing, how the AIJP packet is flowing, what is the meaning of each and every command, that only you should go for it. And it's my promise if you go and complete that CCNP and CCI in a one go, you can clear your CCI exam within an eight, six to eight months. No big deal. Firstly, I know that the passing percentage for the CCI is just 20%, something right? 20 to 30%. But that's my promise. If you are going to complete all the tasks step by step, Understanding the basic concept between each and every topic so about each and every command and each and every type of a packet like the LSA, the hero, and all that. Obviously, you can clear your CCI example in a one go, in a first attempt. You know that more than 70% people fail in a first attempt. But still 30% pass. It means there is a big deal to pass that exam. All right. So in tomorrow's demo, we are going to discuss about the BGP the same way the big basics doesn't matter whether you have the knowledge of CCI, SCCM or not. If it is erased from your memory, still I will start from the scratch, from the basic to the expert level thing. So we'll talk about something BGP, the mid um, understanding about the student, about the working professionals, those who are working here. Now the time to ask any questions. Uh, anything that you want to ask, your back-end team is here also. You can ask about uh, 
anything that you want. Like you want to ask for the uh, inquiry about the timing and all, my backend team will reply. Or any technical questions you can ask me, if you have, we'll wrap up them. Anything that you have in your mind. But yeah, this is my way of teaching. I'm not going to show you a lot of uh, PPTs to unnecessarily read that and waste the time. I will take uh, one topic, explain the concept, explain the fundamental behind it, and then show you the same thing on the left. Right? Any question, guys? Unmute yourself or raise your hand, write down in the chat box if you have any question. It's fine. Let me check. Our uh, backend team is also there. So if you have a new question, I will ask my backend team to take the control. And if they want to say something, see that this is the information to context for the pricing, for the mission, for the timing, for all that you can get it from here. Right? You can see that in the chat box. I think that you want to ask. If you want to ask right now, you can ask because there is an uh, offer going on that my backend team is playing in a mobile way. So, yep, anything that you can ask. Yes, it will be individual student. Each and every student will get the lab access. It's not like they said lab, that one lab will be two all. It will be individual access to the all. And how you will get that? To the RDP. So RDP is a dedicated device, right? To access, like right now I have a RDP connection. So I can access my device. No one is going to come on at that time on my list. You will get that. The proper access of the line. Right? Let me check if there is any more question. Anything that you have in your mind, you can ask. Mm -hmm. No more questions. So, all good. How long does it take to prepare for the AI 1.1 lab? Not to worry about it. Once you are completed with your CCNP, so as I told you, never think that I will first clear the CCNP, then I will go for the CCI. You need to think in your mind and clear in your mind that I am preparing for both CCI and CCNP at the same time. If you do that way, in a six months, you can. You can. Prepare it and you will be ready in, in within a six to eight months. According to the, your uh, uh, understanding, in a six to eight months, you can clear this PCI exam, lab exam. There's a problem with the student. What they do, they think that first I will clear the CCNP, then I will come back again for the CCI. That's going to waste your money twice and your time all, so I will never recommend that. All right, uh, here all, these are the details uh, for uh, the mission process that you can check it here. The number, the WhatsApp number, email is given there, the website is given there, all things you can go and check it and then inform to the backend team, we'll connect with you guys. 